Welcome to the Untangling Web3 podcast, your go-to hub to learn insights and the latest developments in the wild and wonderful world of Web3. I'm Alec Burns. And I'm Jack Davis. Tune in each week as we navigate and explore the rapidly emerging landscape of the Web3 technologies, projects, and ideas that are shaping the future of the internet. We'll be talking to the best and brightest in the industry to keep uncovering insights. So that hopefully we can all learn together on our journey to untangle Web3. Welcome to another episode of the Untangling Web3 podcast. Mr. Jack Davis, how are you doing today? Very well, thanks, Alec. How are you, mate? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. It's a Friday evening. Where else would I want to be than spending an episode recording, spend some time recording with you? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, our, it's our weekly uh, chore or, or fun time. I don't know which it is at the minute, <laughs> but um, yeah, at least we're, we're still here. We're still going, which is nice. And I think... We've we've done over ten episodes now, so we've made it past the uh, we've made the past the point of no return. We've got to keep going. Yeah, that's the crux, typically, isn't it? So yeah, that's very exciting. Um, yeah, I think so. A couple of episodes ago, we talked about data sovereignty and ownership, and I really enjoyed that episode. I think it's super important. And like we mentioned it in the episodes before that as being one of the the primary kind of principles that Web three hopes to address, and. When we talk about you know, data sovereignty and the importance of data sovereignty, I think it kind of overlaps with the topic that we're going to speak about today, like IoT, you know, the Internet of Things, because of the sheer amount of data that IoT collects or IoT devices collect. I think the stat that I read in preparation for this episode was that by 2025, IoT will be collecting 80 zettabytes of data. And I was like, what the hell is a zettabyte? And a zettabyte is, we well, probably know it's Jack, one trillion gigabytes. And even that, that's just such a big number. I, I can't even compute like what that means in humans' terms, but it sounds like a lot, right? Yeah, we're getting into numbers that are so abstractly large that you can't even conceptualize them. But yeah, I agree. It's IoT is a really interesting topic. It's another one of the buzzwords, unfortunately. One day we'll have done them all. But mm. uh, it's, it's, it's a term that's obviously been around for quite a long time. And I think it's one of these things that people have come into contact with without necessarily knowing that they're interfacing with the internet of things. Um, so yeah, it's good that we cover it and I think we can hopefully get a good stab at defining what it is and, and how it relates to web three today. Yeah. So why don't you kick us off then, Jack, how would you define uh, the internet of things? Sure. So I think this is kind of an easy one really, because it's very, very general. So the internet of things is essentially the internet interconnected network of humans and devices in virtually all contexts. It's basically applying um, online, digital, uh, connected nature of things we have on the internet to any device so it can uh, submit data so you can interact with it. You know, the classic example you might have come into is like your your smart home devices that I know Apple mm. and Philips, those light bulbs that you can turn on and off um, from your phone that's the kind of consumer level iot but it is an incredibly general and broad term that can mean basically if you have a device and you have a system that it can connect to then if it's connected it's part of this internet of things concept yeah exactly i mean just imagine like all these everyday objects like your fridge your car your thermostat it's kind of imagining all of those things talking to one another and exchanging data with one another to kind of uh, you know ha share useful information with us and with each other to make our lives more convenient more efficient you know you can have your alarm clock automatically connected with your your coffee machine and when it's time to wake up the alarm clock tells the coffee machine to start brewing and these are the kind of applications that people are, are, have been envisaging with iot for a while now and it's just all about making you know improving the rate at which we connect data and you know through this data collection we can improve the convenience the efficiency of, of a lot of different processes and i think the sheer like 
amount of IoT that will be in our lives like now and probably in the near future. It's just crazy. We've talked about the amount of data it's collecting, but I think that the most recent stat is that there'll be 30 billion active IoT devices by 2025. That used to be 2030, and it's obviously accelerated did significantly in the past two years to now have you know like uh, more iot devices than people yeah definitely i think also maybe right at this starting juncture i would also make the comment that when we talk about iot you can talk about data collection as you've said a lot of times but you've also said data exchange and data sharing and i think those are two related but slightly separate concepts and and mm -hmm. it depends on what exactly you're using these devices connected to the internet for so typically your data collection might be for more industrial applications where you're trying to monitor the state of a very complex system like a warehouse or, or a food mm. supply chain and you need devices and sensors in particular to be taking measurements of temperature um you know atmospheric pressure light yeah. all these things that might be relevant whereas the data sharing aspect might be more your connected homes thing so that's where you're kind of you, you want to um have your your smart appliances react to certain conditions but again there's an element of data collection in that as you say but it's more about exchange in that in that context i think but there's always going to be an overlap of the two yeah i was just thinking like even in that example you just gave um isn't the like say alexa in the home that is that not collecting data or is it saying like the primary purpose is to share data it's like the focus right so you're saying in the industrial applications the focus is the collection rather than the sharing and in in the other example you gave her own home appliances smart appliances the focus is in the sharing rather than the collection is that the emphasis that you're trying to make there that, that's the way yeah that's the way i've always seen it but again there's there's always this gray area of as you say how much data is alexa collecting it's a hot topic that some people are definitely a bit worried about you know how much do we know how much data is being purely collected and then used by the proprietors of these of these devices and the manufacturers and how much is sharing like how much is my alexa yeah. sharing data with my tv that's one aspect how, but then also how much is it recording my conversations yeah. or something like that that people worry about so and, and like oh we've already getting into because this is i find this really interesting and like i guess what the you know the the kind of the applications or the, the the companies that are running these these iot devices would say well you know it's all around making your experience more personalized more like more convenient better for you that's the reason we do this um but you know the eu and a lot of like gdpr compliance is being pushed through right now is all around and saying okay well the users have a right to know and consent to how these devices are collecting data and what mm -hmm. data they're actually collecting and how you're using that and i don't want to get into it now but you're already seeing where the ownership and the sovereignty and the consent aspect comes in with data and you know this gives a little little foreshadowing of how web3 and iot will overlap when we, when we discuss that a bit later but shall we start where we always start and go back to the, the history the origins of iot yeah, I, I agree. Let's let's kind of take a step back before we go into the, the kind of Web3 aspects and how it relates. So maybe just to, to recap really quickly the history of IoT. So if we're talking about Internet of Things, we obviously have to remind ourselves about what the first word means, Internet. So <laughs> <laughs> obviously, as we've just we've talked about at length, but you know, you had these early Internet networks like ARPANET, which were they were the first kind of attempts at having an interconnected world, even though back then it was more about just connecting computer systems, file storage for, for sharing data. And it was it was just a generalized computing term essentially, but that's a kind of grounding for what we mean by internet when we talk about these things and being the first kind of, having the birth in the 1970s of TCP, TCP IP, these, these different protocols that define how data is collected and shared is also kind of an important thing to, to remind ourselves of. Yeah, and an interesting fact while I was reading up on this stuff around um, ARPANET was that the first ever message that was transmitted over ARPANET was low, so L and O, which was an attempt to type in login, but it failed after two letters, which is quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we've come a long way since then <laughs> yeah and i think we've we've talked about this this tcp ip these protocols that basically define how we exchange information on the internet before and i think we kind of gave a, a rough outline of how those work and maybe this isn't the episode to dive deep into those but we, we might push it a, a bit later but i saw like a really interesting explanation from someone that was putting this into layman's terms around what how tcp and ip what their function is and i think they described it as like a, a postal service for the internet 
And the mm -hmm. TCP aspect, it, it breaks the data that you want to send, you know, like a, an image or something like this into smaller pieces and then sends them out into manageable chunks and ensures that they're, you know, reassembled in, in the correct way. And then the IP is effectively the address, you know, it makes sure that the data that you're sending, uh, the pieces that you're sending go to the correct place. And together, they make sure that information travels accurately and reliably over the internet. And that's quite a nice way to kind of explain what the, the point is of these. Yeah, and why it's in, that was a great explanation and, and why I think it's important to talk about it here is that TCP IP, those two protocols, TCP transport control protocol and IP, the internet protocol, they are the fundamental protocols that govern data exchange in general, whether we're talking about the internet we're used to using as, as you know, human beings going online, looking at a website, but also govern how devices now communicate um, and how the internet of things work. So these are still the underlying um, technology rails, essentially, for, for, as you say, splitting up packets of data, um, defining how you share the data mm. um, between between any two endpoints, whether they be laptops or devices, uh, like a sensor and, and a mainframe, and then also the IP, how do you address them? So, yeah, well, what, once you sent it, where, where's it going? How is it going to yeah, get yeah. rooted as well? Because these networks are very big and complex. You know, there mm. are billions and billions of machines, probably more, um, involved in, in the global internet right now and all the devices you have. So, the IP protocol is essentially defining, okay, what's, how do I get to the destination correctly, as you said? Yeah, exactly. And this kind of reminds me of the conversation that we had with Robert Rice around the metaverse and you know, the requirements and the, the necessity to have standards for interoperability so that, you know, different different metaverses or whatever he called them in that episode can speak to one another and objects in one can move to the other. And it's all about having standards to allow this kind of communication between different people, different devices um, to, to be facilitated effectively. Okay. So we've talked about, you know, TCP and IP. Um, so the next big milestone in my mind was the first ever internet appliance, which was in 1982. Have you heard about this one, Jack, the, uh, the Coca-Cola vending machine? Yeah, I have. It's, it's quite a good, uh, quite a good story. Why don't you? Uh, explain? Yeah, I love this one. It's like uh, kind of, I guess, a, a programmer's uh, baby, right? It's like their perfect situation. So they basically made this internet enabled um, Coke vending machine where they could check remotely whether it was stocked. And if the drinks were cold, like, you know, actually kind of getting real time information from like thermostats and temperature sensors in there. And this kind of laid the, the stage for connected devices that could like relay information remotely to, to other areas. I love that's like the first thing that we do with internet appliances you know make sure that there's stacked coca-cola and everything's cold yeah and i heard it came about you know maybe it's apocryphal but it came about because they kept going to the vending machine and and there were there were no cokes left <laughs> cold. so yeah exactly what do the programmers do they decide to program the system communicate uh, with their computers and when we say it's kind of the first internet appliance what we're meaning is basically it's one of the first examples of instead of it being too just kind of um uh, classical computers or what we'd think of as a, a computing device communicating directly with something that isn't a classical computing device. So your vending machine was just a, a dumb electronic machine, um, but wouldn't have any way of connecting out to the system. Whereas then they, they would use TCP and IP to actually send messages to and from their, their laptops or computers to this um to this vending machine to to find out if there were cold drinks in there, which is kind of funny. Yeah, I mean, I think this is again foreshadowing what we're going to talk about later. This is another area where Web three can actually like help. Um, it didn't actually fix the problem, right? It just gave them the information that there wasn't it wasn't Coca Cola in the machine, but it didn't actually help with the procurement. And I think this is we're going to speak about it later. This is one of the areas that Web three can actually you know improve the the ability of IoT. Um, but yeah, maybe that's one for uh, you know a bit later yeah exactly i mean yeah it's good foreshadowing right of why there is a motivation for iot in modern day supply chains and things because now with more advanced computing systems if you see that there's a problem with some stock in the supply chain like it's being stored at the wrong temperature then you would need to take some action on it and you'd need to make sure that batch doesn't get shipped or something and that is all kind of uh, software mod uh, mediated now you have computers doing this monitoring based on the connected devices and then taking action accordingly. But yeah, it's funny that the very first example is kind of uh, uh, is, is related indirectly to how it's used so much now.
Yeah. Um, so then, yeah, it's, and also it's kind of funny that we had the first working example before the actual term was coined. So it mm. wasn't until a couple of years later in 1985. And it's funny because for a long time, actually, the term IoT was credited with someone else uh, in the late 90s. But in fact, they found the, the first kind of reference to the term Internet of Things IoT was from a guy called Peter T. Lewis. And he was giving this speech at um, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. It was an event being held in Washington, D.C. And he kind of laid out and articulated this vision. So I've got the quote here from his speech. Uh, he said, the Internet of Things or IoT. So he even used the actual, you know, <laughs> the acronym <laughs> even then. Uh, yeah. IoT is the integration of people, processes and technology with connectable devices and sensors to enable remote monitoring, status, manipulation and evaluation of trends uh, of such devices. Wow. It's quite cool. It's, it seems like, yeah, that's quite, um, even at that time, it seemed like he can kind of, he kind of envisioned what role iot would play in like the kind of the broad the broad scope that iot would have in our lives now that we're starting to see already and that was that was a long time ago as well yeah it, it was well before even you know the internet was that popular so he was yeah. thinking of the the next iteration of the internet almost before the internet was a thing like it was in, in, incredible it's crazy and then i guess like the big milestones after that were around some of like the, the sensor technology. So a lot of the, the things are around communication over the internet and things like that, Wi-Fi enabled communication. Um, and then we saw in the 1990s, we had the kind of big push towards RFID, which is radio frequency identification, which is just another sensor tool that has become super important and popular right now for IoT devices that allows, you know, tags to be attached to objects to identify things uh, and even tracking and like location systems using like radio waves rather than, rather than just like the internet itself. Yeah, and I think uh, one thing to note here is with, with RFID, you know, they're very small little chips that you can embed easily into devices. And part of the reason is that lots of the devices you want to connect to this internet of things are very small. They will have low power. They won't have much computing power on board. Um, you know, another example that you would be familiar with is I think I think this it's uh, near field, uh, communication or NFC mm, yeah. that's often used in things like bank cards. So when you tap to get on the tube, uh, you know, you, 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 there's no actual physical interface. You, you're, you're having yeah. two devices connecting. And even that, your bank card is acting a bit of a, like an Internet of Things device using one of these new technologies they were developing. Yeah, it's so cool, that stuff that you kind of think you've just got this innate object that's in you know there's no electricity in the card but as soon as you get like a, a frequency from say the the payment device it sends something out and recognizes the car and activates that and you're completely right like it, when we were talking about the 1970s 1980s they would have these big machines like there's nothing mobile about those there's nothing deployable about those and as these kind of these technologies evolved it made them far more mobile it kind of expanded the applications they could think smaller and smaller and put them in more and more locations more conveniently and that's one of the most exciting things about iot is like the range of applications that come from it because of the amount of like sensor technology that's available yeah, exactly. And again, we're, we're talking mostly about sensors at this point, right? Because mm. that was kind of one of the initial use cases was to monitor the state of these systems, maybe for supply chain, maybe for like warehouse management and things. Yeah. But then we had kind of more general purpose, maybe larger IoT devices emerge in the kind of early 2000s and onwards, where that's where you start getting almost the consumer side. They weren't probably going mainstream in 2000s, but we still had the first iterations of that, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you got the, the big players like the Googles, the Amazons, the Apples pushing heavily into this this space. And they were talking about mostly about wearables, you know, or automated systems in the home. I think maybe even the rumba that we talked about like a couple of episodes yeah. ago would, would come into this stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. And I, I'm, I'm trying to think of what would be the first thing that I owned that was uh, definitely an IoT device. Like, it, it, would, it would probably have been something made by Apple because I've never had many of the... Mm the 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 home smart appliances thing yeah yeah but you know even your something like your ipod touch right that that was something that was an internet connected device and it wasn't really there for the data collection and sharing side but when when apple expanded out from just telecommunications to kind of consumer mm. devices that could still connect to things via the standards like wi-fi then 
um, it, beca- it started becoming a bit more mainstream. But yeah, I, yeah. I didn't have a Rumba either. What, would you know what was, would have been the first thing you ever owned that was IoT? <laughs> I think it was like a, I'm trying to think, is it like a, I don't, an iPod Nano or something like that, maybe that could hold like a, a 50 songs or something like that. I think that's probably the earliest one I had. But was that even internet enabled? I don't remember. I thought you had to plug it in and download everything. So I don't know if that counts. Exactly. That's what, that's what I was thinking. So yeah, there, there was there was a kind of scale of consumer devices mm. where, yeah, I think your iPod Nano or something maybe wasn't classed as an IoT device because yeah. it didn't have a way of connecting directly to the internet. It was just something you have to plug in and have a physical interface, whereas your iPod Touch or, or the smart home devices like the light bulbs and things yeah, yeah. that you get, your, your smart doorbells, they're things that actually do have the ability to send yeah. and transmit it messages essentially on the internet um, or via the tcp ip protocols yeah so it was in like the late 2000s and 2008 that the number of things connected to the internet actually exceeded the number of humans on the planet which is quite interesting wow. and then after this in like the 2010s that's where it really became mainstream and we're starting to talk about these like much more intelligent and adopted uh, products that jack's kind of mentioning like the smart home devices the alexas the google homes all these things that are completely normal in our lives now like uh, you know 10 years ago i couldn't have imagined like an, an alexa but now i'm completely reliant on it it's so useful like you don't don't, don't worry too much about the data collection and privacy and all this kind of stuff it is useful and it's so convenient and they're just everywhere right yeah and i think that was you're totally right because it was only in the kind of 2010s and maybe even the last uh six seven years or something where they became fully mainstream and people became very very comfortable with this idea of having internet connected devices collecting data in the home i mean my, my grandparents have an amazon alexa and it's they find it really really useful you know and it's um mm. it, it's it's almost i don't want to say leapfrogged but it's they, they've become very clearly useful to people who may traditionally not have done you know online banking or something mm. so it's kind of you know people who weren't trained to use the internet they would now rely on a device to use the internet on their behalf almost which is interesting it's like we, we talked about this when we talked about ChatGPT. Like maybe I don't know if this is the case with this, but when we talked about ChatGPT, we said that the tech was always there, right? And the, the, the kind of the evolution of ChatGPT in terms of technology wasn't super, super big leaps and bounds. It was the user centric focus mm. that was the leaps and bounds, the ability to make it understandable, digestible to everyday, you know, normal consumers that was that was incredible. And I think maybe that applies to the, the the Alexas, like you kind of said there. The technology might have existed and might have been there. It was the fact that it was so easy for anyone to use it and realize the benefits, like your grandparents and you know, my grandparents used it as well. That was one of the big selling points. It takes a company like Apple or Alexa to make these incredibly in- interesting technological products into something that's super user-centric, super user-focused, so people can realize the benefits instantly. Yeah, exactly. And I think maybe it's also just worth saying here we are talking a lot about the consumer side of Mm -hmm. iot devices and how they required this huge user centricity and and better user experience to be adopted but in the background i think it's fair to say i don't know exactly dates and and data on this but in the background big industry was adopting iot much earlier much more quickly you know with, with um with as things became more automated through the last 20 30 years iot has been a huge part and is now embedded heavily in in many industrial uh processes now we have yeah you think of like car manufacturing airplane manufacturing these these systems these i guess industrial robotic systems that are going around like 24 7 and everything is dialed to such a precision that they need like super advanced and kind of um i guess wide-ranging data collection to make sure that everything's dialed and make sure that there's nothing that's Mm. operating outside of expected ranges because they have that that you know this this term like just in time approach where you yeah. need to like it's the ability to have vast amounts of data along the entire chain of manufacturing enables you to you know save costs on the storage because there is no storage you know exactly when the thing's going to be delivered and you know exactly that something will be available to pick that up and like these kind of like i mean manufacturing has dialed this down to a t it's super exciting but yeah you're completely right we focus quite a lot on the consumer iot aspects because that's what a lot of our listeners will will understand and makes it tangible but like Industrial IoT is a different, completely different mm. ball game, right? And theirs was very much on the data collection side for processes, less like consumer-related benefits, much more on the tech and the data. Yeah, exactly. And it's a lot of it is down to, as you were kind of alluding to, 
having to do things at massive scale with massive efficiency where the margins on on what you're doing are so so razor thin then these are jobs that can't be done by humans or you wouldn't mm. you wouldn't it would, you would be take too much manpower and be too imprecise to not be doing this with sensors and things so iot in an industrial context is much much more high grade and high precision in many ways yeah. about uh, how it affects systems and then on the consumer side yeah, as we were saying, it's 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 it, it is arguably improving efficiency in some ways. Mm. It's improving how efficiently you can control things in your house. You know, yeah, yeah you can put the kettle on before you get back from <laughs> from work or something. But it's also it, it's providing value in a very different way as well for consumers. Yeah. Too. When you talk about industrial IoT, like the ability to say detect a temperature change an hour earlier because you've got IoT that's constantly live streaming this data. For like a pharmaceutical company, that could be millions of dollars or like it's like, you know, these small margins on either the frequency at which you detect things or the accuracy at which you detect things on an industrial scale is huge, huge savings. And that's why it's so important. That's why they're really focused on getting as much accurate information as frequently as possible, which is quite interesting. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, where are we today and why are we talking about it on the Untangling Web3 podcast? So I think it's fair to say there's a, a pretty large overlap at the minute in, in, in the thinking and use cases for IoT and the the benefits of what you can achieve with Web3. But, you know, what, what, what does that look like for you personally? Like, what's the what's the relationship there? So you kind of we mentioned early on that IoT is it, it's physical devices that are embedded with you know software and technologies to connect and exchange data um, with other devices. And I think there's a lot of issues that we've mentioned in previous episodes around the control of this data and, you know, this sheer amount of data that's being collected, a lot of which is about people. And, you know, the, we've kind of said already that people don't know exactly what the data that's being collected is. They don't know how the data is being used. And in my mind, in a lot of ways, they're not consenting to, to any of these. And I think we, we've talked in the, the, you know, the data sovereignty episode about whether one of the primary focuses of Web3 is to alleviate this and give that control and, and sovereignty and maybe even transparency to an extent back to the user. And I think that, you know, IoT really needs those kind of principles to be intrinsically defined within their systems to make sure that they're not doing anything dodgy behind, in, in the background without user's consent, right? Yeah, I, I 100% agree. So I think... Yeah, to summarize what you're saying, like Web3, the principles of Web3 are very much centered around curbing any of the issues people have, especially especially with consumer IoT devices and, mm. uh, you know, using blockchain based systems and digital identity for systems and access control mediated by a blockchain is something that people are uh are looking into as a big intersection of the two you know how how what is the model for sharing data yeah. with these uh, with these devices and how accountable are they um and the accountability and traceability i think is as we always say that's that's a big part of how web3 intersects with lots of things and again with the differences between consumer and industrial iot when we talk about industrial iot it's we're saying oh it's great you can make changes to the supply chain when you detect something's wrong but then you also have this need to make sure you can prove that you've done that. You can prove yeah, we detected yeah. a problem at this time and we took action in, in, in an appropriate time and we took appropriate action. I think that's a yeah. big use case for IoT as well. The auditability aspect. And I think, you know, I'm seeing like a lot of parallels between um, AI and IoT and where Web3 can benefit both. Mm. We kind of said in that AI, AI episode that the obvious application here for for web3 principles in ai is around you know proving data was used in a certain way ensuring that people know where their data is being used and ensuring consent that's the obvious application i think like we've just said that it's exact same principles apply to iot ensuring that users where the iot is collected on users the data is collected on users that the users know that that data is being collected what it is they consent to how it's being used i think another interesting aspect in my mind that i'm seeing parallels between iot and ai is around agency right and like agency which is typically associated with humans um we're seeing a push for this agency toward non-humans so we talked in the ai episode that you know ai's in a way they have agency to now buy services or they have a, a agency to create content and web three, this paradigm shift that's happening with web three will provide the rails for AI to go out into the world and interact 
you know, to, to buy things potentially, uh, to also ensure that the content generated is intrinsically linked to the AI that, that generated it, all the digital identity stuff we mentioned. I see the exact same parallels being linked to IoT. I see you know, IoT sensors being given digital identities. I see IoT sensors being given the agency to procure things. Um, mm. And these things using traditional kind of payment systems would be very difficult, be very difficult for an IoT sensor to you know, transact in fiat potentially but with with, yeah. you know, with whatever digital currency we're potentially referencing they could use that and i think we'll talk about it hopefully a bit more but i think there's a lot of overlap between web3 ai and iot yeah exactly and i think you know as, as you're saying the paradigm shift we're now seeing in iot in particular is away from just using it in a in a single central authority context where you're within a given warehouse or something and we're seeing it used more and more for things like distributed data collection and mm. this idea of pushing out data collection or computation to what we call the edges of the network so instead mm. of it being at these at the central core that is being directly controlled by an administrator by your big company um it you, we're moving to a model where you might have data being collected by even your users as a company and they can host uh, small data collection. I mean, the, the good, the classic example would be, you know, if you can, if you as a, as a user of some service can report some data via your mobile phone and report that back to a, to a company to help them improve their processes. And they might pay you for that data. Of course, yeah. you wouldn't necessarily do that for free, mm -hmm. but that is essentially pushing data collection to the edges of the network. You as the user, the end user are at the edge. You're not in the middle of the network. And that's very much a, a Web3 concept, I think. Yeah, and we're definitely going to come on to the idea of like, yeah, like you said, monetization of data and how micropayments can help enable that and, and make that process way more efficient. Um, but yeah, there's like, there's, there's lots of different overlaps between the, between the two. Exactly. Um, I think, yeah, the, the, the device, to, device to device payments is super interesting. Mm. But maybe before we get to that, we should do our usual consultation of ChatGPT and find out if we've done a hor horrible job of explaining iot so far or not no so this is always the the, the key part of the the episode for i think most of the listeners so maybe we should just like cut the rest of it and just use this each episode <laughs> nice and concise <laughs> okay so um the internet of things within the context of web3 introduces the concept of interconnected worlds that extends beyond standard devices like computers and smartphones to everyday objects like home appliances vehicles and industrial equipment each device collects, shares, and utilizes data to function intelligently and offer seamless user experiences. This data is typically stored, analyzed, and managed on the internet. Okay, I don't think we're too far from that. That, that, that seems you know, pretty reasonable. I think we've gone into a lot of those things. There's a tiny bit more, which is in the traditional IoT context of Web2, the data collected by these devices is controlled by centralized institutions, companies, or servers, which possess various issues regarding data ownership, privacy, security, and interoperability. Okay, so we've highlighted some of the issues right there with IoT devices operating in, in a kind of a Web2 model, right? Mm -hmm. And I think maybe we could go into some of these as like how if Web3 could potentially solve some of these issues, right? Yeah, exactly. So I think maybe we'll carry on from you know what we were just talking about, this idea of distributed data collection and pushing things out to the to the edges. So as as ChatGPT was saying there, right, traditionally your IoT devices would be stored in central servers. And as we talked about in the data sovereignty episode and many other episodes, this is this is creating this big target for data leaks and breaches, single points of failure. Whereas you go kind of moving to a Web3 model for, for managing IoT, it's about kind of storing data either, you know, in, in, a, in a central public ledger where you're not responsible for maintaining that ledger and it can be secured, uh, mm. stored securely and maybe even only attested to, as we've talked about on the ledger. So you're not actually, uh, you're not actually at risk of losing the data or having it yeah. stolen from the ledger and just being able to check it and, then potentially storing the data itself on these end devices and just accessing them when you use them. That's kind of this the same idea we said for you know storing your passwords. Yeah. And and not having them stored by big big companies. Same with storing data. If you're if you're collecting data uh, using IoT devices, that data is potentially very very valuable. And instead of storing it all in one place that someone can steal everything from, 
then this idea would be keep it locally on the devices, access yeah. when you need and permission when you need. And I think we talked about this in the, in the sovereignty episode as well. It's not just like, you know, having these big central repositories for data. It's, it, there's the issue, obviously, single points of failure and breaches and all this kind of stuff. But there's also companies where their business model isn't really dependent on having access to or well, having all this data. They might need it for day to day operations, but they might also be very happy for users to store it on their end and just access it when they need it. It's a lot of liability for, for big companies to actually store, maintain, secure this data. And I think there would be a lot of companies that would be very happy to push this data to the users where they access it when they mm. need to, right? Yeah. And I'm kind of on a similar point, right? There might be many contexts where you have multiple IoT devices that need to talk to each other to achieve a certain task. And the data doesn't even need to go back to the central server or the central mm. authority for, the, for those devices to do their job then it might be data that's just transient and ephemeral by nature so you can also think about reducing the actual load on these servers by just having them communicate directly yeah. and like using web3 like technology primitives to do that more securely authenticate devices um yeah more securely so they can trust one another when they're exchanging that data so it never actually has to involve the central company in that process yeah, and I think this works both ways. Like we've just said that there's a lot of Web3 can bring bring a lot to IoT devices in terms of like the data collection and storage. But I think IoT devices can bring a lot to Web3 and blockchain specifically as well. Like we often hear this term in the blockchain space around garbage in, garbage out. Sure, the data that's on chain is tamper proof and, and immutable. Um, but who's to say that the data that's been put on chain is actually correct or there's no errors in there? And I think you know, when we talk about this, there's a lot of issues with human error. You know, if I'm just writing down or typing in some data that I've collected on on, on uh, I don't know, my thermometer, whatever, I'm working in the pharmaceutical company, I've got a thermometer, mm. I'm just logging the data every minute. I'm That's not, not how it work. works, Alec. That's not how it works. <laughs> I I'm just trying, yeah. What era am I working in? You know, there's an issue there where I might accidentally put a two in instead of a three or something like that. And I think there's there's a lot of avenue for IoT sensors to remove that, that aspect of garbage in by removing human error. And it's not to say IoT sensors are 100% foolproof, but one thing you can do with IoT sensors is actually log you know, the code that's running the IoT sense to see if everything is operating in the way that you'd expect. And I think that just gives you a, a, a better level of understanding and precision and potentially accuracy when you're collecting the data itself. Yeah, exactly. I think there's a really nice example I've seen of this, right, that actually really does combine Web3 and IoT. And it's by a company called Bitping. And mm -hmm. they were doing, they called it distributed network intelligence. And it was similar to what I was describing before <clears throat> about users reporting data back so they were essentially getting users to have the small devices like your mm. phone or your raspberry pi or something and to essentially ping different websites to see if the website's up and mm -hmm. the idea being that, that they're getting a valuable data set so a company would pay for this data and then then they're getting their users to actively tell them if the website is up is up by a given time and that can help them improve the uptime overall of the website so make sure it's not down from the perspective of users rather than from the perspective of their monitoring servers so they would a company would typically have lots of these monitoring servers mm. or outsourced to a third party company to do the monitoring for them but that's still just going from you know uh, an, an idealized system where the the, the thing doing the yeah, monitoring yeah. is likely more connected than your users are and this is a good way of reporting outages from specific parts of the world more quickly. So like you're getting a much more high quality data set about your, you know, the uptime of your business mm. by distributing it to the edges. That's cool. I really like that. And I feel like there's avenue for like the, the micro incentives as well, right? Imagine yeah, being exactly. paid like a fraction of a, I don't know, one one thousandth of a penny or something like that for every ping that you initiate rather than being paid a penny at the end of the day or something. That, that I like that. That's a really cool application. Yeah, exactly. I mean, maybe that's a natural way to talk about kind of the second major overlap then about device to device payments and, and using things like, as you say, micropayments. So the I, I think there's a huge possibility here for, well, both device to device and device to human payments. Mm -hmm. So you're basically involving machines in, in the payment process. And that might be, you know, to create a data marketplace. So you might pay devices for accurate weather data or whatever it might be, but the ability to pay device devices. And that's why we need micropayments, right? It's why we yeah. need 
scalable Web3 infrastructure to do this is because if you're paying for a small increment of data or a very small reading, then you need to value that at a low level. And you also want that to be cheap from your perspective. You don't want to pay a pound every time <laughs> you query the weather, but you might be happy to pay like a hundredth of a penny or something. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of things that we could talk about on this. I think the one that we talked about in the AI episode is that it's really difficult for, say, a non-human to have a bank account, right? You know, you've mm. gone through the KYC process of trying to get a bank account. It's long and tedious, very difficult for an AI agent or an IoT device in this case to, to do that. But it, it would be possible with some kind of digital cash system, right? And then, like you said before, it's it's definitely feasible or there's a, a preference to be able to send micro payments in exchange for data for example and this has there's a lot of benefits like one is the fact that you could incrementally receive data so you know that, that that you're kind of guaranteed maybe a quality of data stream or something like that and there's a lower barrier to entry rather than paying a pound up front but um there's also the, the security aspect as well when we have like iot devices communicating with iot devices you know there's so many out there how do we necessarily know, you know, that, that we can trust the IoT device that we're, we're sending data to? One thing we could implement is digital identity that we've kind of talked about in previous episodes that we can go into in, in, in a bit more detail. But we could also embed things like micropayments per request, for example. You know, you kind of talked previously about in a previous episode about email spam and being able to send mm. you know, millions of emails to millions of devices. And then it's called denial of service attack, basically block up their, their receiving um, capacity with all these spams. But if we say embed a, a micro payment in that, say one one thousandth of a penny per request or email you send or communication you send, it then makes that improbable because everything, every kind of uh, uh, transaction or every communication transaction that's being sent, there's some incentive being sent yeah. to you as well. So you'd actually be quite happily if, if someone's spamming you, right? Yeah, exactly. If, you, if it costs you to pay, send me spam email, I'm quite happy with, a, <laughs> with that as an outcome. But also, I think this idea of device to device payments in particular is really interesting because it provides a natural incentive for IoT networks. Because when we, again, when we say Internet of Things, mm. we're not necessarily talking about a global interconnected where every device can connect to every other device mm -hmm. because you know as we've said lots of the industrial iot is going to be in a closed network system yeah your home uh smart devices are in some sense in a closed system when you introduce micropayments and things i think that is a, an obvious motivator for then mm -hmm. connecting between different networks of iot devices so you yeah, might definitely. have one company who's you, you, it could it could give essentially give all its devices a wallet and say you know if you think you're not collecting data or if you think there's some problem with your sensor for example go and buy the data from a different device nearby and there's, <laughs> yeah. it sounds a little bit crazy but i think there are all sorts of marketplaces that could open up in yeah. the future and i think Maybe we could call this like smart contracting technology or something like this. But, you know, we were talking earlier about that, that Coca-Cola application, right, where they could, the, the, the programmers in the back could see that there was no Coke, but they couldn't do anything about it. And when we start to embed the ability to pay in these in these systems based on some logic, you know, my Coca-Cola machine has no Coca-Cola inside of it, go, you know, go buy automatically pay for more yeah. like coca-cola delivery there's just like so many avenues for this i think we're talking about like home refrigerators imagine being able to automatically restock your milk like this is this is the future i don't want to have to you know go to my fridge yeah. and realize there's no milk every week like i want my fridge to automatically procure that yeah i mean it's a bit it's maybe a bit futuristic but you can think how this could be massive for more efficient supply and demand if you have a certain you know in the future when we're going to be walking into shops and it's going to just be, you know, like the Amazon shops. And oh there's my God. A, yeah. There's not even yeah. a checkout, right? I can see there being that being similar uh, model for how you stock shops. So you don't have a particular vendor in mind. You just have devices that will communicate out onto the public internet to say, I need uh, 10, uh, 10 cases of milk in, in this shop. And then whichever is the closest milk delivery truck will come along. And, and it, it's a bit of a toy example, but I think it will help with scheduling a lots of the of the supply chain right in the future yeah it's cool and when you're talking about that kind of example where it's it, it's open network in a way right you can't mm. you need these universal universally accepted data sets to say okay i need this amount you can provably say you've got this amount and we need like the plumbing underneath that will allow these kind of 
these different actors to operate on the same data set to say, okay, I can deliver exactly. this. And when we start to talk about the things we mentioned earlier about just in time services to make sure your delivery comes at the exact moment that you can then collect something immediately after. So you remove the, 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 the kind of the, the inefficiencies or the, the waste. There's just there's so many benefits. Yeah. It's quite exciting. It's very futuristic. Like you said, yeah. it's very exciting. Just to, so just to summarize, maybe I think maybe this is a good point we've hit on here uh, inadvertently, but I think when you talk about Web3 and IoT, one of the big benefits or one of the, the things that's giving you is you're moving from just pure closed IoT systems to open, interoperable mm. IoT systems. I think that's maybe a general way of, of, of what we're getting at here. Yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to say, basically, all along. <laughs> okay, we should have got ChatGPT to do that for us. But yeah, and I, I do think as well, like we are, I keep saying this, like identity in Web3 is such a kind of a key element that it, that is completely necessary. And I think identity, we shouldn't think of identity of people. And we kind of talked in the previous episode about identity of AI. And I think we're going to see more and more the identity of IoT devices becoming more and more paramount. You know, you need to be able to trust that the IoT devices that you're potentially interacting with day to day, um, you know, the trust is actually propagated from some kind of source. You know, we imagine like a Tesla driving service where all the Tesla cars are completely automated. We no longer need taxi drivers. We just have these Teslas. I want to make sure yeah. that the Tesla that I'm paying and I'm jumping into is actually a registered Tesla and not some kind of hacker who wants to take me off on a ride somewhere. I don't know. But like yeah. the identity of IoT devices, as they become more kind of intrinsic in our lives, is going to become very important. We want easy ways to, to verify the identity of IoT devices efficiently, safely, you know, probably using technologies in Web3. Exactly. I think that's, I completely agree with you, right? Identity is very, very important for IoT devices. And I think Web3 and blockchain in particular is a perfect technology for helping you manage IoT systems because mm. you have this you have this built-in sense of uniqueness. Like every every record you write to a blockchain is in some sense unique and you can check it uh, against that unique record. So you could think about how you assign devices to a given network, how you permission adding new devices to a network using the blockchain how you revoke their access to data and things like that. Mm. Uh, it, it seems like a very natural technology. I mean, th there are also some really cool things. I won't go into it, but uh, we mentioned RFID at the start, right? That is yeah. a kind of a, a way of embedding identity onto physical devices. Mm -hmm. And there are some really cool emerging technologies that are not necessarily in Web3 right now, but things about how you can embed uh, intrinsic identity. There's a company actually called Intrinsic ID, mm. which does this and it exploits some really cool mathematics and some quirks about how devices get manufactured and, and circuit boards. But the long and the short of it is you can now have devices which essentially have self-certifying identity. So they have built-in identity that you can't tamper with because with your RFID tags, you know, mm. you could just take that off one device, put it on another, and that's a big problem that you've got to overcome. But Oh, okay. So I'm yeah. imagining like you have, oh, what's an example I saw uh, in that film Minority Report? You have like, you're actually measuring the granularity of like the, the wood that comes from it to say, okay, there's a unique identifier in the grains of this wood that only this object can have. And it's things like that, right? I think another example yeah. they say is like diamonds. Diamonds have, I don't have much experience with diamonds. so But I think I read that um, diamonds have this like in, intrinsic kind of um, geometric pattern that is unique to that diamond with that characteristics. And there's no way to kind of replicate that, like you say. Exactly. That, that's basically the principle, right? Is that you have physical devices, which you can exploit some of the random uniqueness you have in that to generate a physical, uh, sorry, uh, you, to generate a digital fingerprint from that uniqueness. And it's that uniqueness is tied. And the difference being with RFID, you can just rip the tag off. But with these in, embedded ones, mm. if you if you alter the device in any way, if you damage the, the material, then you automatically change the identifier because you can create the same version. Yeah, it yeah, changes its physical properties. So there are some really cool things you can do with that. <laughs> it's something I, I, I published a paper on a few years oh, really? ago, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to yourself there. Nice one. <laughs> so I'll just, I'll just plug myself. And, uh, <laughs> but no, it's, that, it's just some, re it's a really interesting emerging field. And I think it's, it's just a really good kind of yeah. complementary thing to Web3. That's cool because we talked about that on the tokens episode, right? We have these NFTs and they represent, you know, uniqueness on the blockchain. Um, but when you're you're representing uniqueness on a blockchain for, say, a, a unique item in the real world, how do you 
intrinsically tie those two things together and especially if it's a non-unique item as well and you kind of mentioned that there are tools to create uniqueness in the physical world that we can then tie to the uniqueness in in the digital world that we, you know we get through kind of you know cryptography and key pairs and all this kind of stuff and that, that's super exciting yeah exactly i think it's uh it's a bit nerdy but it's it's very it's a very cool topic everything about this is nerdy <laughs> exactly exactly so jack I know that you got a, a big interest in IPv6 as well, right? And I feel like there's a lot of overlap between IoT devices and IPv6. Yeah, and this is kind of on that interoperability point you mentioned earlier, and also on the identity point, right? This is a perfect segue into to mm. IPv6. And so step back, what is IPv6? And the other one to know is IPv4. Mm -hmm. So we described at the start of the episode the internet protocol ip which is how you address devices so how do i assign a device uh, an identity uh, an address to each each device i could connect to now there's a problem in that back in the, the days of old when we developed a lot of these protocols i said they're standard and they have been standard for a very very long time the problem with the ip protocol is that uh, the version users called ipv4 and that only supported uh, addresses of a certain length. So if you think, mm -hmm. you know, if 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 uh, if our home addresses were only allowed to be ten characters long, then a mm -hmm. lot of a lot of roads in the UK would not would not fit in that space, yeah. right? We'd be running out pretty quickly. So and I guess a, what, a good thing about this is like a good way to reference is like postcodes, right? They're quite yeah. general, like they're not specific enough to define like all the houses within, and there's there's, there's not many options for postcodes in the UK, right? Yeah, exactly. You think how many? Op yeah. That's, that's precisely the point, right? You need you need the the home, um, the house number, and mm -hmm. in addition to the postcode. So yeah. the actual space of possible um, postcodes it doesn't quite fit yeah. every every address we could uh, every every house we have. And yeah. the same is essentially true in the digital world and how we address devices. So these thirty two they're thirty two bits, so basically thirty two ones or zeros mm. in length. And that sounds like quite a lot, but that actually only gives you about around 4.3 billion um, addresses possible, right? Which is, you know, not yeah. enough for one per person on the planet, as you, as you were saying. Yeah, exactly. We've already got said that we exceeded like the number of um, yeah. IoT devices, oh, exceeded the number of people on the planet, like back in 2008. And we're talking about 30 billion IoT devices in what, like two, three years now. And that's like just the number of devices. Like you obviously, you'll want the same device sometimes to change their address and things like this. You don't want to maybe fix the IP address for the device always, right? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we've been talking in a bit of an idealized way, but the truth and the reality in Web2 is we are, we have until recently, we've been mostly using this IPv4 standard, which means we cannot actually allocate every device or every human on the planet with an, a, 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 what, what we call a globally unique address. Mm. So that we simply cannot assign one to everybody. Um, so what actually happens is instead of when we communicate uh, data with one another, it's very much not a peer-to-peer -peer model. We actually go through a number of uh, different kind of gateway servers that have to translate these addresses mm -hmm. into what we call local networks. So when I send a packet over the internet to you, it will get converted in well, the address I send it to won't actually be a unique address for, for you, Alec. It'll be something that kind of identifies your local gateway and then that mm. gateway will translate it back to you. So it's a big problem because yeah. this cuts out all this wonderful device to device connectivity that we're talking about because they'll have to go through many different layers and introduce security problems and things, right? Yeah, but also like the, the identity stuff that we were talking about earlier. If you're saying there's no way to like intrinsically link an IP address to an IoT device, like that's a big issue, right? Exactly. Yeah. So we, we basically don't have a way um, if we just use IPv4 to uniquely identify everything. So everything's a problem, right? Or that whole future is yeah. not going to happen. The good thing is. So I guess this is where you inroad <laughs> into IPv6. Yes. yes. So. Again, a long time ago, another version of IP was created called IPv6. And the, the fundamental difference is it had a much larger address space. It was 128-bit mm -hmm. address space that you have with that. So you get many, many more addresses. It's actually, again, incomprehensibly large. So it's around 10 to the 38 is the number, wow. number of addresses you get from that. And I'll put that in some context as a number. So there are about 10 to 23 stars in the known universe. So... That means you could assign one IPv6 address for every star in a million billion universes. That's quite poetic. You should turn that into you know some kind of 
excellent poem for me. Exactly. Well, maybe I will. <laughs> well, I'll get ChatGPT to do that as well. But <laughs> it, it, it gets to this point, right, that in IPv4, we can't address every human on the planet, let alone all mm. these millions of devices that we're going to have. With the IPv6 standard, we can easily do it. We'll never run out of addresses. So there's this slow transition. I think global adoption is is somewhere in the region of 30 to 50%. And it's been growing quite a lot mm. recently. Like lots of countries in the world are completely moving over to IPv6 adoption. And that's essentially a crucial technology that is also part of this Web3 movement that is going to be required to make all our devices identifiable, to make them interoperable and a bit more secure, right? So we don't have to go through these gateways all the time. Yeah, and I get it. Like I see that that because we have these like unique identifiers now, where it would be almost impossible for someone to 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 guess like an IP address for a device because the, the range of numbers is so very huge. It makes the concept of peer-to-peer -peer, me being able to, you know, communicate directly with an IP address in advance based on like the knowing the address in advance, like secure and, and possible. I think that's really exciting. Yeah, exactly. So I think we've covered a lot of ground there on the overlap and maybe how Web3 and, and IoT will work together in the future to, to do you know various things and solve various problems. But mm. what, so what what is the most interesting one for you? Like, what are you most excited about as an application of these technologies together? I think one of the big ones for me is around supply chains. You know, mm -hmm. I, we've kind of I, I think I talk quite a lot about supply chains. Anything more complicated than a stick probably has a supply chain to kind of create it. And in this like, you know, increasingly globalized world, they're increasingly complicated and they're cross border, they're cross industry typically. Um, and also a big thing, you know, COVID and you know, the war in Ukraine and all these terrible things emphasize the, the importance of effective supply chains and emphasize in a lot of ways how fragile they are. And I see that, you know, IoT, we talked about the efficiencies that IoT brings in kind of an industrial capacity with these maybe much more kind of closed off uh, versions of supply networks where it's, you know, something being made through the process and having all the data being collected. But I see supply chains in kind of the, the biggest scale across borders and for products 